Good morning, good morning. If you will turn in your Bibles to, there you go, I found the magic line to get everybody quiet real quick. We're glad that you're here to worship with us today at the Vine Church. I'm so excited today. I've been told several people, uh, I'm excited about the new series that we're starting today. I'm excited to be here today and uh, trust that you are as well. Hopefully as you went to your seat, you got a bulletin uh, and in that bulletin is a connection card and we would love to have you take that connection card and fill it out with some general information about yourself, whoever might be with you here today. On the back of the connection card, there are things there if you would uh, like to talk to someone or have information. There's even a place for prayer requests uh, that we could pray for you. Uh, we would count it a joy uh, to do that. So make sure you get a bulletin, make sure you get a connection card, and so forth. Uh, we have changed the order of worship up a little bit today, so I don't want to catch you off guard. Um, so if you have kids... Uh, we're still going to do a good set of music, and at the end of the music, uh, you'll just send them to the back, and they'll be dismissed up to uh, up the up the way for their class. Uh, usually, it's a little bit earlier in the service. Today, it'll be a little bit later because we're doing um, so much of the music together. Uh, this is Family Promise Week, um, and so we're providing dinner for Family Promise Ministries tonight, Monday, and Tuesday night. Um, if you have an interest in helping in that, uh, come and speak to me. Um, and I can give you the details and, and what we need to do and well, how we need to accomplish that and so forth and so on. Um, some details are in the bulletin about that as well. And uh, next Saturday, we are having a men's ministry meeting. And uh, we'll be gathering at 9 o'clock. I'm cooking breakfast next week, like real legit breakfast. Uh, so we'll have that next week and Bible study and prayer time together. And uh, again, the details are in the bulletin. I want to encourage you to get that. Um, I want to do something special today. Uh, today is Maggie Duke's last Sunday here, officially. All right, so Maggie, come up here. Come up here. Maggie uh, has been running our camera system and our live stream system and all that uh, for the last two or three years. And uh, she is... Uh, leaving us to go fulfill part of her dream, which is to become a full-time dog, right? A full-time dog. And uh, so she's leaving this week to move up to Athens. And, um, and so that, so I want to do something today. Lisa, I'll, Lisa, could you come up here and stand with her? Somebody, give, 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 them, give them your phone. Give somebody your phone. There you go, give it to Aaron over there. Okay. You come up here, and I'm going to ask Joe and Carla Cook to come up here. They head up our young adult ministry. And I, and I huh? Well, Joe can step back in. His wife's getting him, I can tell. See? Oh, maybe not. Oh, okay. All right. So, whenever you see Joe, everybody ask him, where were you at? Okay? All right. But Maggie, I want to say a couple things to you. One, I appreciate uh, your service uh, that you've given us here at the Vine Church. Uh, you've been very faithful, very diligent. Uh, when you were going to be out of town, you would tell us. When you know you weren't, you were here to work and serve and, and, and do all that. And I really do appreciate that. Reliability is a great characteristic that you have, and I, I appreciate that. Secondly, I want to encourage you. Uh, you've dreamed about this for years. Uh, it's been a focus of yours all through middle, high, and even the first couple of years of college. And so go and chase that dream. Go up there, have a good time, uh, enjoy yourself, study hard, okay? Um, but go and do that. But I want to pray a blessing over you, if that's okay for you this morning. Father God, Lord, we thank you for Maggie, and we thank you for the ability she has to, to go fulfill a dream of hers, Lord, to... Uh, to go up to Athens and to go to UGA and be a student there and to graduate from there uh, in her studies. And Lord, I just pray as she leaves here and, and leaves the comfort of home and leaves the comfort of schedule and leaves the comfort of familiarity, that Lord, you'll surround her uh, with great friends up in Athens. You'll surround her with great Christian friends up in Athens, Father. And I pray that as she goes off, that Lord, her relationship with you would continue to grow and grow strong. Uh, Lord, we look forward to the times when she'll come back into town and we'll get to see her and and catch up with her, Lord, and we just thank that. But, Lord, we just pray um, that you would bless each of her steps uh, as she heads up there, as she uh, goes into an apartment, as she goes to her classes, that, Father, you would just guide her, bless her. Uh, Lord, we just look forward to great things uh, that Maggie will do in your name and for your glory 
uh, in her life. And so, Lord, we just lift her up to you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Thank you, thank you. You guys can be seated. Well, again, there he is. Well, again, we're glad that you're here today. Let's stand up and greet each other, and then Tucker and them will lead us in some worship.
We're bringing back one from 1981. I need your participation a little bit this morning. So for the next three lines, I'm going to sing it and then you'll repeat it, okay? Let's practice it. You ready? Here we go. I will call upon the like that back from the old school Psalms 18 this morning Psalms 18 we sang it now we're going to read it I love you Lord oh Lord my strength the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God my rock in whom I take refuge my shield the horn of my salvation my strong I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Walking down to 46. You're welcome. I'm not going to read it all. The Lord lives, blessed be the rock, and exalted by the God of my salvation. salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed. The Lord liveth, blessed be the rock, my fortress and my salvation. Amen. I 
think we ought to praise about it. Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain.
able to have peace. You may stay still for just a moment. We find that being in your presence is a heavenly place. Lord, as we continue in our worship, and the message is given. Well, if I knew that my art could have looked like that, I probably would have done a lot better in school uh, when it comes to art class. I always thought it had to make some sense or some semblance of order. Uh, I want to start this morning, uh, the message time, I just want to give a big shout out to uh, Brad Grant, Kim Grant, Johnny Babb, who were up here yesterday for about 12 hours uh, installing our air conditioning system in our kids' building. And they were able to do that because... Uh, of your faithfulness to our loyalty day offering that we took up uh, back in May. And um, I honestly hope your kids go home today and say, Mom, Dad, the room was so cold today. All right, so I'm hoping you'll hear that today. Uh, but again, I really appreciate them uh, being up here all day yesterday uh, to install that. Suppose I went to downtown Perry and sat on one of those benches that they have out there for people to sit on. And uh, as people would pass by, maybe I'm sitting outside of Joy's shop, uh, initial reaction down there. Uh, maybe I'm sitting outside of her shop, and as people come by, uh, I say to them as they pass by, hey, I'll give you a million dollars. And I'm sure there's some people who would just sort of look and chuckle and keep walking. But, but there were some who would at least stop and say, what? Like, did I hear what you just said correctly? And I said, here's the catch. I'll give you a million dollars, but you have to live the rest of your life by yourself on an island. Now, it won't be, it won't be like castaway. You, you know, you, you'll have food, you'll have a place to sleep, but suppose that, that I, I put you there and I offer you that. Now, we know that there would be some sarcastic people, right? Some sarcastic people who would say, oh, a million dollars and I don't have to live with them anymore? Oh, that's great. My dream come true. And at the same time, probably his wife would say, you know what? My dream come true. But for the most part, most people would not take that deal. You know why? Because what good is a million dollars if uh, if you can't take your family on vacation? What good is a million dollars if you can't share it with others? What good is a million dollars when you can't spend it to help others? There's actually a guy named Mr. Beast on YouTube, and he does similar things like this. He, he, um, he does, his, his example is not as extreme as mine, 
But one of the things that he does is he'll take like 50 people and put them uh, in a Walmart and tell them the last one to stay here gets $100,000. And so that'll be the deal. And, and they start out with 50 people. But here's the amazing thing. You would be amazed at how quickly the first 40 people drop out. Like in the beginning, it sounds like a great deal. They may make it one night. But, but by and large, by the next day, they're sort of like, uh, I'm, I'm, I can't do this. And so the first 40 drop out real quickly. It gets down to about 10. They last longer. It gets down to five. It lasts a little longer. It gets down to the last two. And they really sort of battle it out because at this point, they feel like they could see the money. But why do most people not take that deal? It's one word. Community. Not that word. Community is the word. Now here's the definition of community. A group of people whose members have a common unity or a common interest or a common idea or a common thought. And we know that we have lots of communities in our lives, right? We have family communities. You have that, that family community that lives under your roof. Uh, you have that extended family community of those who live outside of your house, but they're obviously related to you. We have work community, right? Uh, of the people that you work beside 40, 50 hours a week. Uh, we have sports communities, right? Uh, your kids on a ball team, and, and they have a common interest, and they have practice and games, and so there's a community there. We also know in three or four weeks that we're going to have uh, the adult sports community kick off with college football, and all that kicks back in. We'll be excited about that. We know that there's a hobby community where people are focused around certain hobbies. We know that, that people go and join hunt clubs, and, and it's a group of people that are going to hunt this land for the year, fishing communities, those kinds of things. And we even have a faith community. Uh, that's sort of what we have here is a faith community. And, and the reality is that we were designed for community. In fact, we actually desire community, and even though we don't do it right all the time, and even though uh, we do it bad from time to time, it is a God-given, built-in need that we all have. Now, if we could be honest, we've all been hurt uh, by community at some point. We've all had our feelings hurt, uh, you know, whatever it may have been, whatever community it may have been. We've all experienced that, and one of the things that happen when we get hurt at communities, we sort of draw in and, and draw back and, and isolate. And for some, it's, 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 it's really hard at that point to then open back up. And many of us may have experienced that. But if God's design for us is community, then what do you think Satan's desire for us is? Isolation. Isolation. We need community. This week I just sort of came up with three reasons why we need community, and I called them the ABCs of community. Uh, here's the first reason we need community, and that's accountability. Accountability. And if we're honest, accountability is one of the reasons we shy away from community. We don't want somebody to keep us accountable. Most of us will let ourselves down before we let somebody else down, right? Somebody... Uh, uh, we'll let ourselves down before we let somebody else down. But we need accountability. Not only that, but we need belonging. Right? We all want a place to belong. And if we're honest enough, we know that bad things happen when we're isolated from others. I watch a lot of documentaries, and it would not surprise you that most serial killers are people who lived isolated. They weren't in community. They live isolated. So we, we need accountability, we need a place to belong, and we need C, connection. I mean, plain and simple, we are better together. We are better together. As believers, as Christians, we have the power of the Holy Spirit working inside of us, and individually, we can accomplish some stuff, some things. But the reality is that if all of us who are Christians in this room focus our hearts and our minds together on a task for Christ, we become an unstoppable force on this earth. If we could come together and have that connection and have that belonging and have that accountability with one another, I learned this lesson uh, of all places in the gym. It may, you may not believe it to look at me now, but several years ago I did a triathlon. And when I did a triathlon, I trained for nine months solid. 
I, I can remember when I started in January, it was cold outside. I was riding my bike in, in the rain and the cold just to start and begin my training. And throughout that nine months, there were times when I would meet Scott Godman uh, over at Cantrell Center in, in Warner Robins, and we would swim laps in the pool as part of the training. There were times when I would meet with other people at the gym and, and go work out, sometimes really early in the morning, which is not my thing, but, but I would get up and go to the gym early to work out with them. I went with Scott and Tammy about a month before the race, and we went up to the lake. Just to, the, the race was you swam in a lake, so we went to swim in the lake. The week before the race, we went to the, the course, and we rode our bikes over the, the course that we were going to ride the next week. And what I learned was, I will bail on myself before I will bail on somebody else waiting on me at the gym. It's easy for me to talk myself out of training. It's easy to talk myself out of the gym, but if somebody is waiting on me there, I will never miss. And that's part of community. Well, our series that we're starting today is called One, and it's all about community. And, and in fact, though literally the more I think about it, every principle, everything I'm going to say to you can apply to all of our communities, our family community, your work community, and so forth. The, the, the community that I'm really focused on is our faith community, our church family, our, our faith community. It might surprise you, it may not. That, that over 50 times in the Bible, this phrase is used of one another. One another. The Bible tells us to honor one another. It tells us to greet one another. To welcome one another. To fellowship with one another. To agree with one another. To be kind to one another. And the list goes on and on and on. Like I say, it's almost 60 times in the Bible that it uses these phrases and so today, I want to start with one of those phrases that we find in the book of James, chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, turn to James, chapter 5. We're going to read one verse to sort of kick off the morning, and, and then we'll have several other verses throughout the message time. James, chapter 5, and verse 16, says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So we see here that James tells us to confess our sins to one another and to pray for one another. To pray for one another in our communities, to pray for one another in our family, to pray for each other at work, to pray for each other in our teams. I mean, I was thinking about this week, parents, if you have kids on a team, have you ever maybe thought you know what, I'm going to pray for all the kids on the team. But yet, he James tells us that we need to pray for one another. Spurgeon said that prayer meetings are the throbbing machinery of the church. Uh, that's where the work is being done. That's where the hard work is being done in the life of the church is through prayer. Now, when we pray for each other, it's, it's, it's called interceding for one another. To intercede for them, and you'll find this word, uh, in the Bible to intercede for one another. Here's sort of the definition of that. That is to make an appeal or a petition on behalf of someone else. Not to just to pray for yourself, but to pray for someone else. And when we do that, we are interceding for them. The Bible speaks a lot about this. It tells us that Abraham interceded for Sodom. That Moses interceded for Israel. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. So he tells, he's telling young Timothy here, pray for all people, intercede for them, uh, thank God for them, ask God to help them. You may want to write this down if you're taking notes. Prayer is the one thing that nobody can ever stop. Even if somebody's mad at you, they say, and you say, I'm going to pray for you. And they say, well, don't pray for me. They cannot stop you from praying for them. Prayer is the one thing that we can always do. Paul even asked the Colossians to intercede for him. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Verse 3 says, pray for us too, intercede for us. 
What are we interceding for? What's the appeal that we're going to make to God? That God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. Pray that I intercede for me that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. So all throughout the Bible, it talks about intercession and praying for others. But did you know that Jesus intercedes for you? Jesus is your intercessor. Jesus makes an appeal and a plea for you. Romans chapter 8, verse 34 says, Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand. Here it is pleading for us, interceding for us. So not only are we supposed to intercede for each other, we need to realize that even at this moment, Jesus is interceding for you. And so that's one of the things that we need to do is we need to intercede. We need to pray for others. So what happens when we pray for others? Well, the first thing that happens when we pray for others is we grow. We grow spiritually when we pray for others. Anytime that we obey Christ and what he's told us to do, it grows us spiritually. It grows us in Christ. And when we're in community and we obey the word of God and we're willing to pray for one another, we will in fact see ourselves growing spiritually. It's, it's, a, it's a great concept, but so many of us miss it, that, that if we'll just obey what God has told us to do, We'll see ourselves grow spiritually. So we grow. What else happens? Well, not only do we grow, but it impacts others. When we pray for others, obviously it's going to impact them. It helps, it helps lift others' burdens. Right? Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 says, Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. As we pray for others, we find ourselves developing empathy and sympathy for others. You see, prayer, when I pray for you or you pray for me, it invokes our emotional, our mental, and our spiritual connection with one another when we're praying for one another. So not only do we grow, but it impacts them. It helps lift their burdens. Not only that, it, it unites us as a community. It is powerful. It is a powerful thing when you know someone is praying for you. Back in, back in March, um, our Sunday night prayer group was reading a book, and part of that book uh, was called When the People Pray, and, and, and part of it was a daily devotional that they read. Uh, it had a, 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 a verse, some thoughts, and a real-life story that went with whatever the topic was of the day, and it was all revolved around praying for your pastor. And, and can I tell you, in 17 years of being the pastor of this church, 17 years, I have never felt a lighter burden than the month of March. Why? Because I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that seven or eight people were praying for me every single day. And in 17 years, I could tell you that those were the only 30 days that I felt like everybody was praying for me. It went so well that we gave everybody in the church the book, and we said, we want you to read it for the month of April. And if, if you did that, then you were praying for me throughout the whole month of April. But there's never been a better time. Why? Because as they were praying for me, it lifted my burdens. It drew us into community. There were conversations that we had throughout that month. And sometimes they would say, I had no idea that would affect you. That way. I had no idea that that was you know, part of the reality. Tell us how you feel about this. And so in some ways I was even able to open up and share things as the pastor. But it lifted my burdens that month, even to the point that one person came up to me and said, your preaching has been totally different these last several weeks. Now, I didn't know whether or not to take that as a compliment or, or a slam or whatever, but, but that's what they said. And the, the reality was there had been burdens lifted off of me while people were praying for me. So it lifts others' burdens, it unites us in community, but also it shows the world a different way. As believers, we're called to be the light of the world. We're called to be the light that is, that is on the hill, that is seen by the world. And one of the things that I'm understanding more and more and more and more is that Christ is always at work. 
God is always at work, and though I don't always know it, and I don't always know where, I don't always know how, the fact is that he is. And he calls us to be a light to shine on him because you don't know how God is working in someone else's life. You don't know how God is working in the life of that person at work. And so as you pray for them, you don't know what God is already doing and stirring in them. And so as you pray for them, it shows the world a different way. It shines a light for Christ. Let me, let me, just, let me, just, sort of, if, let me just sort of tell you how this plays out. Like, like God nudges us, right? There are times when God will say, pray for those folks. This week, I was sitting there working on my sermon, and out of the blue, I felt like God said, pray for this person. And so I did. I stopped what I was doing. I prayed for that person. It wasn't a long prayer. It wasn't a lengthy prayer. I didn't even know what I was praying for specifically. I just prayed for them. And so when I got to pray for them, I sent them a text that said, hey, just wanted you to know I'm praying for you. And the response I got from them was over, well, you won't believe what God's been doing. You won't believe what God is, is showing me. You won't believe what God's doing in my life this week. You won't believe. See, I didn't know all of that was taking place. I had just been sort of nudged by God to pray. Friday, they had to rush my mother-in-law back to the hospital. She's been in the hospital, I don't know, 10 times since, since January. And they had to take her by ambulance, and they rushed her to the hospital. Yesterday morning, uh, she went unresponsive for a bit. And, and I have no doubt that, that yesterday morning, God nudged some people just to pray for Monica, for her mom, for her family, not knowing what had happened, but he just nudge people to pray for them. So, so yesterday, she went unresponsive. They, they got her back responsive, whatever that means, and found out today through some tests that she'd actually had a heart attack uh, yesterday when, that, when all that took place. Last night, I'm sitting in the house on the couch, and I get a text from my stepmom that says, I have your dad at the hospital. I think he's had a stroke. I have no doubt that yet last night God nudged some people just to pray for me, not knowing what they were praying for, not knowing that my dad was rushed to the hospital, but God nudged you to pray for me. The question always comes back, do we obey when God nudges us? When God says, hey, pray for those people, do we obey God when he says to do that? We don't need to know the time, the place, the circumstance. We don't have to know what all is going on, what all the answers are, but when God nudges us, to pray for one another, we need to obey, and we need to pray for one another. That's how it practically plays out. And so many times, God will nudge us, and we just sort of blow it off like, you know, I don't know what that means, or I, why would I stop now to do that, or why would I, you know, whatever. But we never know what God is doing. We never know where God is at work. And so when he nudges us to pray for one another, we certainly need to pray for one another. Here's the third point. Not only uh, do we grow, not only does it impact others, but it also brings glory to Christ. And as a Christian and as a believer, that should be our goal. In everything that we do, in everything that we do as a believer and as a Christian, whether it's in our profession, whether it's in our family, the goal should be to bring glory to Christ. Ephesians chapter 3. It says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask. How do we ask? Prayer. Right? The things we ask of God, how do we ask that? It's through prayer. So, so now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. It, when we pray for one another, it brings glory to Christ. So not only do we grow, not only does it impact the lives of the people that we're praying for, but it brings glory to Christ, which should be our goal each day. So let me just build this from the ground zero. Let me ask you some questions. How many of you, don't raise your hand, just, just answer this to yourself. Do you get the prayer list that is sent out by me, by the church, each week? Now, if you don't, the first thing I want to say to you is take a connection card or a sheet of paper, write your name, your email address, and, and write prayer list, and get that to me, and I will add you to the list. So if you don't, that's, that's what I want to encourage you to do. If you do get that list, let me ask you this question. 
do you open it? Do you open it? Do you read it? It's a long list. There's lots of names on that list of people I don't even know because maybe you put it on it. It's your cousin or whatever. It's a long list of folks, but do you open it? Do you read it? And then here's the last question. Do you in some way pray for those people on that list? There's about five or six categories on that list. Maybe you pray for a category a day. Maybe you just look down the list and you end up praying for the people on that list that you know because many of our names are on there. But, but, but that's just one avenue in which we can pray for one another. And if we can all agree on how valuable prayer is, I don't think there's any discussion or dissension on how valuable prayer is in our lives and in the life of our community, then why don't we do it? Over the years, I've had lots of conversations and asked that questions a lot of times. I've gotten this answer, well, I'm really busy, Rick. I'm really busy to really have a, a time to sit down and pray for one another. I'm doing good just to have time to pray for myself. I'm just that busy. Some people have said this, and maybe this is you. They're like, I'm really intimidated by prayer. Like, like just the, the idea that I'm talking to God directly intimidates me. And, and I've had people say this, I, I don't really have the right words to say. I really don't know what to say. But the reality is the Bible tells us that we need to pray for one another. And as we pray for one another, we will see us drawn together in community. We will see us come together as one. One of the areas uh, in our life and one of the areas in our church that we need to uh, become one, that we need to have community is among our men. And so I've asked Bud Pierce to come and to just talk about our men's ministry uh, for a minute. There's some things coming up, some things that are a little different, some things that are changing. And so I wanted him to come and share that because men, we need each other. Men, we do. And I know sometimes we play the, the tough card, and I don't need anybody, and I can do it all by myself. But the reality is we need one another. But Which is next Saturday, by the way. Yeah, this, this, this Saturday coming up, it's a state tournament. So that's second Saturday of every month at 9 a.m. Uh, we're going to meet at the back porch down there. And if you have never been there, you can uh, pass the school or school car there and you can come out to the back porch and join us. So it's uh, uh, 9 a.m. second Saturday of every month. Uh, so this will be our kickoff for fall. Uh, and this month we're going to have a great service um, that we're going to put together. Uh, it's so good. In fact, that we actually did it back in May. 
Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, bud. Hopefully you can make it there. We would love to see you there. Because, guys, we need that. Uh, we're the first ones to try to isolate and say, I can do it all on my own in my own strength. But we need each other. We need that accountability. We need that place to belong. We need that connection with one another. So I want to give you some opportunities that you have uh, to pray for one another. Every Sunday morning, we meet at 915 back in the overflow room back there. And we have a, a prayer meeting. We pray for uh, the service in particular. We pray for our church uh, directly. We pray for, there may be some needs like today. We were praying for uh, my dad and mother-in-law. We, you know, we may pray for some of those things. But it's really to pray for the worship service, to pray for our church and so forth. That's every Sunday morning at 915. On Sunday nights, we have a group of people that pray at 530. Back on the back porch, uh, down the hill down there. Uh, Miss Pat heads that up, and so we, we meet each week and uh, pray back there at 5.30. And then Wednesday nights, Fred and I have been getting together and, and praying at 5 o'clock right here in this building. And so those are three opportunities that you have uh, to connect with people and to help us pray for one another. I also want to let you know that coming up on August 18th, we will have our next night of prayer. So I want to encourage you to be here for that. It's at 5.30. Details are in the bulletin. I want you to have opportunities that you can come and pray with us as we pray for one another. Two last things. One, I want to encourage you to memorize James 5.16 this week. Uh, it's not a long verse. It's not difficult to learn. So I want to encourage you to memorize that uh, this week under the area of praying for one another. And then I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to do this this week if you can. Find a way. You could use the prayer list that I'll send out or whatever. But find a way to pray for seven days for our church. You may pray for your life group. You may pray for our church. You may pray back on the, um, the thing as you walk out. There's prayer lists for different areas of ministry. Uh, they need to be updated. I haven't updated it since before the summer. So some of them need to be updated. But there's children's ministry, youth ministry, Worship ministry, men's ministry, women's ministry. Take one of those with you. That will give you something to look at, to read, to pray. So I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to challenge you to every day pray for one another. And, and I believe, uh, because God's Word tells us to do it, that if we will do that, we will see great things happen. Now before I pray, Aaron wants to come up and say something. Aaron, you coming? quickly and then after Aaron shares I'll pray and then Tucker will lead us out I'm going to use the mic because I can't even hear myself right now uh, man um, I had no clue actually just like you most likely didn't that this is what Rick was going to be preaching on this morning but I felt a push and an urge this morning as I was talking with Monica uh, just to pray over the two of them uh, because I know that they've been through a lot this last week. Um, I know that as you know, someone on pastoral staff that works in the staff of the church that not only do you have to carry your own burdens, but oftentimes you have to carry the burdens of the church as well. And so uh, I wanted to take a minute this morning before we leave, uh, just to pray over Monica and Rick. And I wanted to ask a couple of our men if y'all could come up as well. Uh, and we'll just lay hands on both of them. Monica, please come up here. Um, and, uh, and just to pray over them and pray over their parents, pray over their family. Um, and just take a minute to, to hopefully provide them with what Rick just preached on. What better way to put it in a practical application. Um, so, yeah, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I thank you so much this morning. Um, God, just for the uh, word that you have prepared, uh, God, the message that you put on Rick's heart. Uh, Father, we trust and know that you are in control. God, that you are sovereign in all things. God, that nothing catches you off guard. And Lord, that you still sit on your throne. Father, this morning we know that um, our pastor and Monica are heartbroken, 
God, that they've got a lot of um, hurt in their family. God, that they've got sickness and, and God, things that are just looming over their head right now. And so, Father, we come to you this morning as a church. Uh, God, and we just pray that you would give them peace and clarity during this time. Uh, God, that you would give them all of the steps that they need to take to provide their family with peace. Uh, God, we thank you for their leadership within our church, and we just pray that you would continue to build them up. God, as they carry their own burdens, as they carry the burdens of the church, Father, I pray that we as the church would come alongside them and help to lighten that load, whether through prayer or through service, God. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would continue to move in their lives. Father, I pray for each of their parents that are going through all of this sickness and unknown right now, God, that you would just be the great physician, that you would do the healing that only you can do. Uh, God, we are trusting you in all things. God, we thank you for this service and this message this morning. Father, I pray that we would be a church that prays together for each other. Uh, God, I pray that we would be burdened this week, throughout the whole week, not just to pray for each other, but God, to pray for our pastor and for his wife and, and for their parents, God. God, we pray for specifically Monica's mom, God, that the doctors that they're going to go see in the next week would help to shed some light on what's going on. And Father, we pray for Rick's father as it seems he's had a stroke. God, we just pray that you, you would give the doctors all of the care and all of the things that they need just to help see him through this. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for his wife. And we thank you for their commitment to the divine church. And we just pray that you would continue to fill them with peace and confidence in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This happened. Because I probably wouldn't have let you do it. <laughs> Too and bad. I appreciate it. But it makes a difference. It does make a difference when you know that people are praying uh, for each other. And uh, we're a church family. We're, this is, we want this to be your faith community. And so if there's ways that we can pray for you, we certainly want to do that. Uh, let's pray. I know we just did, but let's pray. And then, Tucker, you guys are going to lead us out today. Father God, I pray you would help us to become one. I pray you would draw us in community with one another. And, Lord, we know that we're not perfect and we, we don't always get that community part right. We know that there's probably people in this room today that have been hurt in the past by community, and so it makes them sort of gun-shy to open back up and to open themselves to, to community again. And, Father, we pray that in our, in our faith community, in our church family, uh, that you would draw us together as one. Lord, there's a lot of things that we can accomplish individually, but there's so much more that we can accomplish together. There, we can uh, impact the world individually, but there's so much we can impact publicly. And, as toge and together. So, Father, I, I pray you will guide us in that today. Lord, I pray that you will speak to us. I pray that you will guide us this week. I pray that you will this week urge us, nudge us in those moments to pray for one another. And, Lord, I pray that this week we will be faithful in that. Father, what a light it will be to the world. What a light it will be as our burdens lift as we pray for one another this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to share this with you before Tucker then starts singing. I just got a message. I don't know if it came in late last night, early this morning, uh, from our pastor friend in Peru. And now I'm starting to call him my pastor friend instead of using his name because you know that several weeks ago I told you their house had been vandalized. They had been threatened. Um, they feel like it's by some human traffickers who, who are there. And they, so they moved. They, had, they moved from this house that had been vandalized over here to a different place that would be safer. Praise, you know, I got a, a message, praise the Lord for that. But the message last night or this morning, whenever it came in so quickly, was that these people have been, like, approaching his daughter and approaching his, outside his wife's work and approaching, but, oh, do you know such and such? Do you know pastor such and such? And so even though they moved, or they felt like it would be safer, it's almost like, 
things that were said in the message, these people were following me, trying to find me. So this week, as God nudges you to pray for Peru, to pray for Pastor, please don't hesitate. Because we don't know what's happening at that moment. God nudges you this week, I'm begging you, please, please, please pray for me. Tucker, come and sit beside me.
Thank you so much for being with us this morning. We hope that you've been challenged. Go be God's people, and we'll see you next week.